those who believe have life in Jesus' name. Those who believe that this risen Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, King, the Son of God, those who believe they have life in Jesus' name. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller. Glad you're with us as today we begin a message looking at the risen King. But Jonathan, you talk about the fact that those who believe in Jesus have life in his name. I want you to talk a little bit about that that phrase. What does it mean to have life in Jesus' name? Well, John, the writer of this gospel, tells us that his whole purpose of writing the book was so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And I I presume that John means there that as we trust in the name of Jesus, and, and the name of Jesus sums up his identity and who he is and what he has done and the power he possesses, and as we entrust ourselves to the Lord Jesus— who he is in his entirety, we receive the gift of life, life that begins now and stretches into eternity, spiritual life, even eternal life. And those who believe, we trust that Jesus has the power to give us that life. And so we receive life in his name. Well, join us in John chapter 20 as we look more at what it means to have life in his name, and begin this message called The Risen King. Here is Jonathan. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, today is a special celebration of the victory of Jesus Christ over the grave. Easter Sunday, it is about the defeat of death and the triumph of life in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That message of Easter, it is always a powerful message. For the Christian, the celebration of this weekend is always bright, and it's always joyful. And I have to say, this year and this Easter Sunday, it feels especially timely. It feels especially needed. It feels especially bright and it feels especially hopeful. We are now living through the most fearful pandemic that the world has seen in a century and more. Our comfortable illusions of immortality through modern medicine and through universal health care and all the rest, those illusions have been unceremoniously shattered and swept aside. Our world's most gifted scientists are confounded by this invisible virus. Our best hospitals are overwhelmed. Rich and powerful nations around the world are crying out for basic supplies that they cannot procure for any price, and we are all forced, each one of us, to confront this ugly reality of death. The fearful reality of death that is filling our news feeds and perhaps touching your own life in some way, it's shaken you. And you want this Easter to give special consideration, fresh consideration, new consideration perhaps to spiritual realities. To be entirely honest, you are looking for hope. And you're wondering, perhaps in a way that you've never wondered before, you're wondering if the message of Easter holds hope for you. Well, if that's where you are today, I'm especially glad that you are joining us. I'm glad because we all need to receive hope in this present time. And as we turn to John's gospel to hear of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, we are given the joyful news that Jesus Christ offers the concrete hope of eternal life to all who will believe. On Good Friday, Jesus has been crucified, and he's been laid in a tomb. And in John chapter 20, where we're focusing today, we pick up the story early on the Sunday morning, on Resurrection Day. Mary Magdalene, a faithful follower of Jesus who had actually stood by him at the cross, she now comes to the tomb where Jesus has been laid. But the great stone that sealed the tomb, it's rolled away. 
and the tomb is empty. Bewildered and concerned, she runs to get the other disciples. Two of them come to look, and they find within the tomb the linen burial dressings, but no body. Now, we have to remember that these devoted disciples, they don't have a full understanding of what was happening. They had listened to Jesus speak about his coming death and his coming resurrection, but the penny, it it hadn't dropped for them. And so when Jesus was arrested and Jesus was taken away and Jesus was crucified, most of them abandoned Jesus in fear and in confusion. They thought that it was all over. They, They hadn't understood that it was his intention and his plan both to die and then to rise. They hadn't understood what the Old Testament had predicted and promised about the death and resurrection of the Christ. But suddenly now the penny drops for the first disciple. And this is perhaps John himself, verse 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. The other disciples go home, but Mary Magdalene stays standing at the tomb, weeping. She hasn't understood that Jesus is alive. To her, the tragedy of his death has now been compounded by the theft of his body. But then a man appears to her. She thinks this is the gardener, and and then Jesus speaks her name. And at that moment, she recognizes him, and she runs and tells the other disciples, in joy and in amazement, I have seen the Lord. In the next scene, we come to see the disciples gathered in a house, cowering with the doors locked. The religious leaders that lobbied to put Jesus to death only days ago, they think perhaps they will come for them next. But in the midst of this fearful scene, Jesus appears. He speaks peace to them. And he shows them his hands and his side, still bearing the wounds of the cross even now in resurrection life. One of the disciples was missing from this gathering, a disciple named Thomas, and he ends up having his own unique experience of the risen Jesus. And this is where we pick up the story now. I'd like to read from verse 24 of chapter 20. And it would be great if you could follow with me if you've got a Bible where you are. John chapter 20, verse 24, down to the end of the chapter. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Risen King. Stay with us. We'll get back to this message in just a moment. By the way, if you ever miss a broadcast or you want to learn more about this program and about Jonathan, you can always visit our website and find more there. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. And while you're there, I hope you'll check out our our weekly devotional material. Again, the website address, EncounterTheTruth.org. Let's get back to the message. Here's Jonathan. Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the others in that locked room. So he heard about the resurrection of Jesus secondhand. 
The other disciples tell him, we've seen the Lord. He hears the message, but he doesn't physically encounter the risen Jesus. And for Thomas, that's just not good enough. For Thomas, it's all simply too hard to contemplate, too difficult to accept and believe. And so he speaks those words for which he has become famous, for which he has become known as the doubting Thomas. He says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into his side, I will never believe. Now, it's easy for us to be hard on Thomas, I think, but, but the truth is the other disciples, they were able to see before they believed. And truthfully, we can understand on some level how Thomas feels. After all, the miracle of a dead man rising again to life, it is a big miracle. It is a huge deal. Well, eight days go by. And the disciples are back in the room with the doors locked, still fearful, no doubt. And this time, Thomas is there. He's with them. Jesus appears to them again. And again, he says to them, peace be with you. Jesus could have come along and, and rebuked Thomas and given him a hard time for his failure, his refusal to believe based on the testimony of the other disciples. But Jesus is so kind and Jesus is so patient. And he says to him, Come on, observe the evidence for yourself, the evidence that you have demanded. Touch my hands, touch my side, and believe. Now, it seems as though Thomas stopped short of doing that, but simply seeing the evidence for himself, he answers with a powerful confession of faith, my Lord and my God. Thomas has seen the evidence, and Thomas has now believed. It's, it's not wrong to see the evidence of the risen Jesus, of course. That was the special privilege of the first generation of believers. But Jesus wants to use this opportunity to teach us something very important, to record a vital lesson, not so much for Thomas then, but for us now, for us today. He wants us to know that seeing him physically, having the evidence before our eyes, it is not necessary for us to have that if we are to believe. In fact, says Jesus, there is true blessing available for those who do not see and who yet believe. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's fine to be part of that first generation, to see the risen Jesus. We, we might imagine that they are the specially blessed generation and that we are at some huge disadvantage today. But, but Jesus says no. The, the generations to come who believe without seeing, they are truly blessed. There is a special blessing from God for those who will hear the word of the apostles, just as Thomas actually heard it back in verse 25, and who will accept that apostolic message on faith. The blessing upon such people is nothing less than this. It is acceptance by God, and it is the gift of eternal salvation. It is the blessing of life. And it is just as equally available to those who do not see as it is to those who did. Now, at this point, John the Apostle, he moves out of the background. He, he steps away from simply being the narrator of the story, and he steps into the foreground, and he tells us why he has written his book. He tells us how he, as one apostle and one eyewitness of these events, how he intends to be part of the process of belief. Verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, in, in my gospel, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus did so much else in his earthly ministry. He, he performed so many miracles that were signs of his identity and signs of his mission. But, John says, I have written this much down in my book so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life. As we celebrate Easter Sunday 2,000 years after the 
events of the historical resurrection of Jesus. You and I, we don't have access to the visible, physical evidence of the resurrection. The risen Jesus, he is now in heaven above. But here is what we do have before us. Here is what we have in plain sight. We have the witness, the message of the apostles. We have their testimony written down. We have John's testimony that Jesus died and he rose again. And John's purpose in writing is that we should believe that testimony and by believing have life in Jesus' name. I think there's essentially one big point to this remarkable passage. And so I only want to make one simple point in this sermon. For those expecting three or four points, I hope you won't feel too disappointed or shortchanged this morning. I want to make one simple point, then I want to apply that truth in two simple ways. Here's the point. Here's the heart of this resurrection passage. It is simply this. Those who believe have life. In Jesus' name. Those who believe that this risen Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, King, the Son of God, those who believe they have life in Jesus' name. God promised centuries and generations before that he would send a king into the world, a Messiah, who would be his own son. He would liberate his people from bondage and bring them into a glorious future. The Israelites of Jesus' day thought that their Messiah would come and liberate them from Roman oppression and lead them into a glorious political and national future future. And so when Jesus came along and he didn't take up a sword and he didn't lead a political movement or set out a political vision, the people, they just didn't know what to do with him. They eventually came to resent him and they largely rejected him as their Messiah. This man can't be the promised savior. Where is the sword? Where is the political movement? Where is the king that we've been waiting for? and hence their eagerness to have him removed from the scene. But what so many people failed to see was this. God's plan for his saving king wasn't so small and so meager as for him merely to bring about a political or a military liberation to save the nation from the Romans or any other worldly power. No, God's plan and God's ambition was far greater His Christ, his Messiah, his son would come and liberate humanity from its deepest bondage and address its deepest need. The Bible tells us that the root cause of all pain and all suffering and all bondage in this world is the fact that we've turned from God to live our own way without reference to him. We've become alienated from him as a whole people. We've invited his judgment for the evil that we have thought and said and done, and we experience the fruit of that rebellion as the beauty of human life ends again and again in the tragedy of the grave. Now, now that's our deepest need. That's our biggest problem. We are a people who were created to live, but because of sin, we are destined to die. And so God's plan for his Messiah was for him to come into the world and pay the price of that rebellion to bear the judgment for sin at the cross and then to rise again in victory over the grave. That was God's plan for his Messiah, his saving king, even his son. And what John wants us to see and what John wants us to believe, verse 31, is that this Jesus, the risen Jesus, is indeed the Christ is indeed the Son of God, is indeed the Savior that the people of God had been waiting for all these years and generations. John has recorded plenty of miracles in his book, plenty of what he calls signs, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, it is the greatest one of all. You see, if Jesus did in fact conquer the grave, then all his claims must be true. His gospel must be valid. His power, it must be limitless. And the record of the resurrection is here in John chapter 20 for us to consider, for us to accept, for us to believe. We have eyewitness testimony. And of course, 
added to all that, we have the evidence of 2,000 years of history since. History that shows us how the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ has transformed lives and reshaped world history. And so today we have an offer and we have an opportunity. There is blessing for those who have not seen and yet have believed. There is nothing less on offer than life in his name. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and part of a message called The Risen King. And we're going to continue this message on our next broadcast. Hope you make it a point to tune in. If you ever miss a program, you can always listen online at EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported broadcast. That's exactly what it sounds like. We depend on your generosity to keep Jonathan's teaching on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount, we want to send you not one, but two copies of his book, The King, the Cross, and the Meaning of Easter. And uh, Jonathan, as you sat down to write a book about Easter, what were you setting out to uh, accomplish? I mean, what was your goal as you began to write this book? Well, you know, I'm really fascinated that we've got uh, four Gospels in the New Testament. We don't just have the one. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. And I've always been particularly fascinated by John's account of the Easter story and and especially actually of the the trial of Jesus uh, leading up to his crucifixion and and it seems to me that there's something very remarkable going on as Jesus undergoes the trial of a criminal before he's crucified quite unjustly entirely unjustly there, there's something extraordinary that's taking place there that the the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, should allow himself to be taken through this awful process and should be humiliated in such a way, really, and, and, and willing to endure that. And I think within the trial, what we see is, although Jesus is facing trial at the, at the hands of a human judge, what John wants us to see is that Jesus is the judge. And although Jesus stands before a human ruler, what John wants to see is that Jesus is the supreme ruler. And the fact that Jesus, who is judge and who is ruler, should endure these things for our sake, it, it heightens for us our understanding of his dignity and his grace and his mercy and his majesty. And, and that's something I really want to explore and I try to explore in this little book. And I, I trust that sort of walking through that together and exploring it together will be will be rich for readers, will be stimulating, will maybe be a little bit challenging, maybe for some of our perceptions of the Lord Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, and, and ultimately will move us to respond to him personally in faith and adoration. Jonathan, I, I could see for the person who knows Jesus, this is just going to be a reminder of who he is and uh, remind us of the fact that he paid the ultimate price for us in going to the cross and, and lead us to worship him. Uh, but for the person who doesn't know Jesus, I could see how this book could even potentially be used to introduce someone to Jesus. And I really hope it will. And the book is is written you know, with that aim certainly in mind. I, I think it'll be particularly helpful to those who might see you know, Jesus really as a victim in the whole story of Easter. Hmm. You know, you maybe think, well, he's a good man and it's a tragedy that he died in this way. And of course, that's true. But what we see as we really examine the gospel accounts, in particular John's gospel, as we do in, the, in this little book, we see that Jesus is not the hapless victim, but he is actually the sovereign God of the universe who is allowing himself to go through this trial and to endure this agony for a set purpose for the sake of our salvation. And so he's doing it in extraordinary grace and extraordinary mercy without sacrificing one ounce of his dignity or even of his control of the situation. And and that's a remarkable thing to understand and to engage with. And I, I trust, yes, I trust it will enable many readers to make a personal response to the Lord Jesus. Well, we would love to send you not one, but two copies of Jonathan's book, The King, the Cross, and the Meaning of Easter. It's our thank you gift for your financial support this month. One copy for you to read, one for you to give to someone who needs to maybe meet Jesus this Easter season. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-888-346-9141. 
833-99-TRUTH. Again, the website, EncounterTheTruth.org, and the phone number is 1-833-998-7884. Well, thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us next time.